Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to this week's episode of All About Canadian Books. This For this week's reading and author advice, I have Catherine McKenzie as a guest. Catherine is a best-selling author, and if you missed my Behind the Book interview with her, you have to watch it because Catherine talks about her new book, Six Weeks to Live. There will be a link down below in the description box and also at the end of this video. Hi, Catherine. Hi. <laughs> so, Catherine, you have written 11 books, um, which is incredible. <laughs> very prolific. Bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> what type of advice do you have for aspiring writers? I think the advice that I always give is to be a big reader. Just read, 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 read. Um, I don't have an MFA. I, I didn't take a writing class before I started writing my first book. Yeah. I learned on the job, but I had spent 30 years before then, you know, reading everything in sight. And I think that um, if you're not a big reader, I'm always curious, like, why do you want to write a book if you don't like, if you don't like reading fiction? Yeah. Um, but I just think it's so important for so many reasons from technical reasons, like mm -hmm. what, what does a book look like in its interior, but yes. to how are books structured and, and how, what is the rise and fall of an arc and what's the difference between commercial and literary. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just to be a writer of your own time. I think it's important to you know read the classics, but I think it's also important to read contemporaneously, particularly in the genre um, in which you're going to write or you are writing so that you know what else is out there, not to steal ideas or to copy anybody. or <laughs> yeah. But but just so you know what else is out there and 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 what the marketplace looks like and and again not with a view to being cynical about it and mm -hmm. and trying to write to the market but just being of your time is um there are so many reasons for a publisher to say no yeah. um to your book and there are some that you can control and many that you cannot but one of them that you can control is being um within the parameters of what books are supposed to look like and what types of books are selling and how long they're supposed to be and all that sort of stuff. So that's my advice. So everyone read, read and read, read, <laughs> read, read. It's read. fun. Isn't reading fun? It's reading is fabulous. Fun <laughs> and read Canadian, read Canadian. <laughs> Absolutely. There's tons of great um, Canadian contemporary fiction authors now, you know, we all got um, uh, inundated with Canlit growing up. Yes. But that is is and, and maybe discouraged because of it. Yeah. But it is that is not the end of Canadian fiction. So no, we've 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 got some fabulous talent out there. We do. And what what are you reading? Like what's on your bedside table right now? <laughs> uh, I just what am I reading? I'm reading a book by Carol Mason, who's a Canadian author mm -hmm. um, uh, to blurb it. Her book comes out in a couple of months. Yeah. called between me and you or between you and me mm -hmm. one or the other yeah um and two other books i read recently that i really enjoyed were um the invisible life of Addie larue mm -hmm. uh, by ve schwab and the midnight library by matt Haig. he's a british author yeah that's I on really, my table yeah it's really good i really like both of those books um, I also recently read Lucky by Marissa Stapley, who's another yes. Canadian author. Yes. Um, her book just came out a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for another good thriller after you read mine, of course, um, <laughs> I highly recommend it. Yeah, I, I read Lucky as well and, and got a, a, had a lovely chat with Marissa. So it's it's so fun to be reading these incredible Canadian thrillers. Like, I love Definitely. It. Definitely. Love it. So um, speaking of books, your book, Six Weeks to Live. Um, yay. You're going to give us a little reading, Catherine. But before you do, can you just tell us why you've chosen this particular passage to read? You know, whenever I read, I always read from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of chapter one, Insane in the Membrane. Jennifer. Ah, OK. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Jennifer, but you have a primary glioblastoma in your brain. That's brain cancer, I whisper, the words a rasp in my throat. Yes, the doctor says. I've been told his name, but I can't remember it for the life of me. He isn't my regular doctor, just someone in his practice I was referred to when I first came in a couple of weeks ago. The physician I'd seen for years, Dr. Turner, retired last year at the age of 78, right after my last physical. This new guy looks young enough to date my 25-year-old daughters. 
I have a grade four cancer. The knowledge comes to me unbidden. He nods. I'm dying. Yes, he says gravely. You have six weeks before. He shakes his head as if he's disappointing himself for ending my life. The world tilts and I grip the arms of the chair I'm sitting in. They're rounded at the end and slightly worn as if they'd been clung to in this way before and more than once. A bad news chair. The doctor watches me. He has watery blue eyes and a rash of acne scars near his dark hairline. I'm sorry, Jennifer. I squeeze the chair arms harder and focus on a spot above his head. There's a large tank built into the taupe wall behind it with a small school of fish, flashing silver and red. This is what my taxes are for, fish tanks and doctors who look like the prodigies on medical television shows. So all of this, I say, motioning to the body that's betrayed me, it's going to get worse. He clears his throat and looks back to his notes. I might be the first person he's ever had to deliver this type of news to. Yes, the tumors in your temporal lobe, which regulate speech, memory, behavior, vision, hearing, and emotions. What this means then is that you can expect an increase in the headaches you've been having and also potentially issues with your speech mood and half of me listens to him cycle through the symptoms I'm already experiencing. Memory issues, achy joints, all the reasons I went to the doctor in the first place and the symptoms yet to come. Behavior and personality changes, seizures, swelling, and then the other half of me is focused on the fish and the patterns they're making in the glowing water. Mm -hmm. I've always thought I'd like to have fish, but somehow in the chaos of raising the triplets, I never got around to it. Now I envy them the fish. They're oblivious and they're circling the tank, looking for the last remnants of lunch. Do fish hear like humans do? Or is their whole life what you like when you sink your head into the ocean? That echoey muffled sound of sound. The doctor stopped talking, waiting for my reaction to a question he might have asked or simply to the information he's been cataloging methodically. My hands are cramping on the chair, so I let go. The room is still spinning though. I'm tumbling through space, a satellite off his axis. I try to think of something to ask. Is there anything more I need to know? And then it hits me. In the litany of signs and symptoms, I didn't hear anything about treatment. And there's nothing we can do? He shakes his head like a sad dog. There's some good palliative options for when things get worse. Not surgery, chemo, radiation, Maybe if we caught it earlier, but we didn't, I say, and he agrees. Whoa. <laughs> and there it begins. And so it begins. And so it begins. Yeah, and you have to read it to find out what um, Jennifer does. And, you know, I think as a reader as well, Catherine, one of the other questions that I kept thinking, especially after reading that opening chapter is, you know, what would I do if I had six weeks to live? And what what would you do if you had six weeks to live? I mean, I really do think I'd go to the nearest beach if I yeah. could. Um, yeah. I love the ocean and I love being near the water. And, and yeah. so I think I'd take a couple of close friends <laughs> yeah. and family and, and, you know, do that if, if I could. Um, and we're not always given the luxury of, of that kind of choice, but yeah. I don't think I'd be trying to solve my own murder, but uh, you never know. You never know. I know. <laughs> I know that Jennifer had an incredible six weeks between, between trying to solve our murder. Yeah. Well, it's a distraction too, right? Like ultimately, yes. and I think she has a strong sense of justice and I think she doesn't feel like she's had justice in her life. And so, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. really like Jennifer. I thought oh, she, good. Yeah, she was, a, I thought she was, a, she was a strong woman. Definitely a strong woman. Well, thank you so much for being a guest today, Catherine. Thank McKenzie. you for having me. Greatly appreciated. Again, for our viewers, I'll put links down below with information um, of where you can purchase a copy of Six Weeks to Live. It's a great thriller, a great escape. And I hope you have better luck than I did figuring it out. <laughs> No, let the book take you on a journey. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to figure it out. It's a great journey. And you know what? That's part of the fun. That's part exactly. of the fun. Exactly. So exactly. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.